To Know Christ, a television ministry of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. Here's your host, Reverend Jeff Peterson. Well, today our topic is the two kingdoms of God. And so we wonder, what are the two kingdoms of God? Well, you have the kingdom of government and you have the kingdom of the church. Now, a lot of times we hear people say, well, we have to have the separation of church and state. And that is true, at least to a degree. You know, sometimes I think that our understanding of separation of church and state is that, okay, God, you are allowed to be in the church. If there's any place in this world where you are allowed to be is a church, but as far as the state goes, that's where, God, you are excluded. And you have no business in the state. It's kind of like where we are free uh, from God here. We can just now go about our own business. You know, we have our own authority. It's like, it's like God's authority and humanity's authority. That's kind of the way that we want it, okay? For those who want God's authority, you can go into the church. And you can listen to the pastor and the teachers teach about the ways of God. But when it comes to humanity's authority, we would say that that is the state. And God, you have no business being part of our human business. God, you have no business jumping in in anything that we would consider to be state or, or public. Well, the thing that we have to always remember is that the state is also ordained by God as is the church. I mean, both are equally God's kingdom. God has established the government. God has established the church. God has created all things. Everything is under God's domain. And that's the thing that we must always remember, is that God is the creator. God is the creator of the universe. God is the creator of this earth. God is the creator of our lives. And to somehow think that we can separate, saying, well, Somehow, this, is, this belongs to God, and we try to make that as small as we can. And the rest, well, that belongs to us. And then all the Bible addresses all those kinds of things. You know, where, you know, we, we see where rulers, you know, just kind of think, well, we are now the owners, and, and so when, when the master sends his workers, you know, we just simply can do away with them. And then when his son comes, thinking, well, now if we just kill him, then we will... If we kill the heir, then we will all now be, that all, everything will belong to us. But isn't that the thing that is so ironic about it all, is that as we have killed the heir, being Jesus, God's only son, that is in Jesus' death and his, his resurrection, that Jesus dies for our sins so that we can all be his heirs. Okay, so let's get back to uh, church and state. So how are we to understand this? And so that there is a balance. Because, you know, sometimes today we see that we have separation of church and state to the point where the church has nothing to do with the state, and the state has nothing to do with the church. We, the state simply says, church, you stay out of our business. And the church is just saying, okay, well, if that's the way that it is, then all we're asking is that you stay out of our business. But then as we look in history is that sometimes the church and the state has been so intertwined that both the church and the state became corrupt. And so in a lot of ways, yes, it's good that somehow we make a distinction between church and state, but yet to understand that both are ordained and instituted by God and that they are to work hand in hand. And so I'm going to read from, from John chapter 18, uh, verse 36, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prepare uh, to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. Jesus spoke this while he was on trial. He was being tried by Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of Judea. Where Jesus simply says, my kingdom is not of this world. And so what Jesus is doing here is that we see that, that he's on trial. 
and we see we're basically the kingdom of the government and the kingdom of heaven now are clashing so much that they are having a debate. It's like the church and the state are now having a debate. And you got the, you know, two, well, Jesus being the most powerful person that ever has been, but then you have Pontius Pilate, who is the most powerful person of Judea, and one of the most powerful people in the world at that time. Well, so it, basically what we have is that we have people of authority here. And oftentimes that's when we think about a kingdom. A kingdom is someone who is the ruler over a domain. In other words, this nation, the, and then this ruler, that this ruler has authority over this nation, this people. And so you have a pilot who is the ruler over Judea, who is now having Jesus on trial. Because what Pilate is concerned about is that people are calling him a king. And Pilate can't have any rivals. It's not like we can have two people who are ruling this land. And I don't think Pilate you know, so much cares about what Jesus' religion, religion is and what his beliefs are. It's just like I can't have two people ruling this land. And so that's a lot of it, is that if you go around saying that you are a king, you're going to end up having to go to trial. And they're going to try to figure out, well, just who are you? Are you really a king? Or are you just some nutcase, nutcase that says that you are a king? But for Jesus, it's not so much that he was regarded as a nutcase because he actually had a lot of people who were following him. And so this was a threat to Pilate. It was a threat to the Roman Empire. I mean, not even so much to Pilate as also Herod, who was the governor of Galilee, but then also when you think about all the way to the Roman emperor. And so the whole question is, is that you are a king, and Jesus just simply said, well, where do you get this from? Are you making it up, or did somebody tell you this? Jesus basically saying, well, my kingship, in other words, yes, I'm a king, but not a king in the way that you would think that I'm a king. And that my kingship is not of this world. In other words, I'm the son of God who has come into this world from heaven. And I'm here to establish my kingdom in this world which has no boundaries. And so that's the whole thing is that we can say, well, this person is the president. Or this person is the prime minister. This person is the emperor. This person is the king of this land, of this country. But beyond its borders, that yes, the king, the emperor, the president, or whomever has allies and has power and authority in other nations as far as being allies. But really, that's as far as one's ruler or one's authority goes. Whereas what Jesus is saying is, no, my kingdom is going to be established in all of the nations of the world and here again, the kingdom is the church. God is establishing the church in the world. <clears throat> and so what is the purpose of, <clears throat> of government? Well, government is to bring order to society. It's important that we have order to society. Government is to legislate just laws and how important it is that we have just laws. Government is to protect the people. And part of just laws is to protect the people, but if there's wrongdoing, if there's injustice that is going on, or if people are being harmed, it's up to the government to say that we are here to exercise our authority to make sure that people are not being harmed and also that the government does punish people who do break the law. The government is working to establish society in a way where there's good infrastructure, where we have roads and schools, hospitals, all of the, all of the community works that make it so that we can turn on the faucet and have water. 
that we have, that we have a, a police a staff, you know, patrolmen who are, who are patrolling our neighborhoods not only during the day but also during the night. And so the government is ordained by God. Why? Because God cares about you. God sees that you need all of these things, that you need hospitals, that you need schools, that you need roads, that you need um, water, water works. You, know, you need all these things that the government provides, social security, protection of the people, a police force, an army, all these things to protect you. And so government is good. It comes from God. And when you have a good government, and when government is doing what it's supposed to be doing, it's a good thing. It's an important thing. And so be proud of your country and be thankful to God for all of what God provides for you through your government. And so when we think about government leaders, we think about leaders like also in the church. Now, now, when you think of a pastor or a priest, there are expectations that you have of the pastor or the priest or anybody who's a, a leader in the church. These are just givens. Now, we're not expecting these people to be perfect people. We're expecting them to be Christian people. And there is a difference. You know, that, that this is a person who lives by the love and the grace of God. And so these are the things that a religious leader is about. First of all, that a religious leader is not saying, well, I've got my own agenda. That I want this, posi this position of authority because now I have authority and I can just kind of push my will on everybody. No, that's not a what a religious leader is all about. A religious leader sees oneself as being accountable to God, saying it's not about me, it's about God. It's not that Jeff Peterson's ideas and will and, and whatever he wants and likes, that that's what, that's what this is all about now. No. It's about God. It, it, that it's Jesus' church. And so the religious leader is saying that, you know, I don't live my life for myself. I live it for God. And I'm not just accountable to myself. I'm accountable to God. And so that at the end of the day, it's not so much what Jeff Peterson think, thinks, it's what God thinks. You know, have I been faithful to God in this day? Have I been doing God's will today? Because that's what matters. And so a religious leader is going to be concerned about the people. That as God is concerned about the people, so now the religious leader is concerned about the people. That the religious leader is going to have love and compassion for the people that the religious leader is going to have concern. Concern to make sure that there's justice, that people are being treated fairly, that everybody is okay, that if a person is, is doing well, that the religious leaders rejoice in that, if a person's hurting in whatever way, that the religious leader hurts and is concerned, I'm there for you that the religious leader is going to be a person of high moral integrity. The religious leader is going to be honest. You don't have to question or wonder, you know, is he or she lying to me or not telling the truth? No, you should never have to be questioning that. That the religious leader has the best interest of the person because God has the best interest of these people. And so the religious leader is going to be honest, the religious leader is going to be fair, the religious leader is going to be looking at the best interest of the people, the, be the religious leader is going to be seeing what can we do with, with God's people, how do we work together so that we are a community, and that what one person cannot do, to get, you know, together we can do it. And so for... <laughs> Government leaders, it's the same thing. It's the same expectation. That if a person is running for office because I've got axes to grind and I've got my personal agendas, 
that are going to benefit myself or my few people who are like me, then they better not run for office because they got the wrong ideas, the wrong motivation. That a religious leader is saying that I'm here not because I'm accountable to self, I'm accountable to God. You know, this isn't my world, this is God's world. And God wants me to be operating in such a manner. Because at the end of the day, it's not what, what I think, it's what God thinks. It's not what matters to me, it's what matters to God. And so the government leader, the political leader, is going to be honest and a person of integrity. This person has got the welfare of the people in mind. How do I lead these people so that people can prosper? John Locke, the great English philosopher, you know, that people can have, you know, those inalienable rights of, of life, liberty, and to be able to pursue their dreams and, and to be happy. And so the same concerns that a religious leader has are the same concerns that a political leader has. You know, it's the same difference. It's not like, well, because I'm uh, a leader of the government that I don't have to be uh, like a pastor or a priest or somebody who's... No, it's the same thing. That both say, no, I'm accountable to God. I'm going to be a person of integrity. I'm going to be honest. It's not my agenda. It's God's agenda here. In other words, I'm here to care for the people. I'm here to legislate fair laws so that everybody is taken care of. I'm here to benefit people so that we don't have people out in the streets who are homeless. That we can at least be providing the basic needs of people. But if we have a leader who you know, has got their own agenda and to say, well, I'm here because I represent these few people so that we can all become rich and that we are all frolicking around in our big yachts and boats when we have people now who are homeless because of it. You know, so that's the thing, is that you ask yourself, what kind of leaders do you want to have? Do you want God-fearing leaders, people who love you, people who are concerned about you, people who are going to be honest, people who are going to be working for your best interest? Or do you want leaders who don't see themselves as being accountable to God? They only see themselves as being accountable to themselves and what's right for themselves. Is this really the type of person that, oh yeah, it's okay to have an atheist as my leader, you know, who really doesn't care, who has no love, who has no empathy for me? You know, it's interesting, you know, I'm not a person who goes snooping. Sometimes I'm just kind of hanging around on a, on a street corner and all of a sudden I just happen, I just uh, witness, you know, something that's going on. And so it has to do with education. Now here again, what I'm going to have to say is going to be incredibly politically incorrect. And so if you can't handle it, you might want to brace your ears. <clears throat> but there is a certain college. That's a Christian college. And they are training you know, the teachers to go out and to teach. Now here again, as I speak, when a job opens for teaching, especially elementary school, you've got so many applicants, maybe a hundred people who want the job. Okay, well at this school where they're going to have being people who are going to be graduating from college to be teachers from this Christian school, that you have principals who are sneaking out the back door at night, and they're going to the school, and I'll tell you what, these students, they've got I don't know how many school districts who are begging them to come and to teach at their school. Here again, they've got hundreds of applicants for each job, but yet before they will go through those applications, they go to these schools, and here again, this is politically incorrect, and I'm sure that these uh, principals and school districts don't want anybody to know what they're doing. But they beg, will you come to our school? We want you to teach our kids. What is that saying? It's saying we want Christian teachers teaching our kids because we see that there is a significant difference in how they go about teaching our kids. And so, they're, so they will go across country to this school 
begging a teacher to come in hopes that one will say yes. And here again, they got hundreds of applicants wanting that one job. But before they go through the applicants, they'll go to the school in hopes of getting one of these teachers to come. So it says something about Christianity, doesn't it? It says something about the Christian, that there is something that is special, there's something different, that these are the people that we want in our schools teaching our kids. Okay, so as far as the government goes, there's a few things that need to be said. And the first is from Mark chapter 12, uh, verses 13 through 17. <clears throat> And this is where, where Jesus is talking or where the whole issue is being addressed as far as who do we pay taxes to. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know you are a man of integrity. You, you aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, Whose portrait is this and whose inscription? Caesar replied, And Jesus said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Okay, so, what, so what's happening here is that Jesus is being asked a trick question. And however he answers this, he's going to answer it wrong. And in answering this question wrong, all of the authorities are going to be able to get him. But Jesus in his wisdom, and sometimes I wish I sure could answer these tough questions because I get put in these situations a lot where people will come and basically we give you your choice, Jeff, between A and B. And if you choose A, it's wrong. And if you choose B, it's wrong. And I just think, oh, I wish I had the wisdom of Jesus at this point because I know that he would answer this in the correct way as he does here. Because basically what they're putting before Jesus is that we're giving you the choice between A and the choice between B. If you choose A, it's wrong. And if you choose B, it's wrong. But what does Jesus say? Well, look at the coin. It's got Caesar's inscription on it. You know, here again, basically everything belongs to God. So are you going to try to say that there's something now that doesn't belong to God? But he's saying that it's all part of, it's all God. You know, government is God's. The church is God's. And so pay your taxes. But then also... Give your offerings. Both are very important. They both need to be supported. And then I think about what is written in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, uh, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong, do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you, for he is God's servant, to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath, to bring judgment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone uh, what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. 
And so we are to obey our governing leaders. We are to obey uh, those who lead us because it's important, as it says, it's instituted by God. Okay, so then we got the kingdom of the church. And so what is the kingdom of the church all about? Well, the kingdom of the church is to provide for us what government cannot do. Even your best leaders cannot pro provide what government, you know, what the government cannot. And so what does the church provide? Forgiveness of sins. Government cannot do that. Eternal life. Our government cannot provide eternal life. But that is what Jesus does is that Jesus died on a cross for us and is arisen. That the kingdom of God entrusts us with the word of God and God's instructions, his good instructions for our lives. And that the church is to continue the work of Jesus Christ in the world. And the work of Jesus Christ is to bring the good news to people that as people are hearing the good news of Jesus Christ, that they're brought to salvation. And as we, and Jesus commands us in Matthew chapter 28, at the end of the, the chapter, verses 18 through 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and, and to teach them all of what I have instructed them, and I will be with you always until the end of the age. And so what Jesus is saying is that, that the kingdom of Christ is to grow into all of the nations, so that we all may have the salvation of God. And that as we grow in relation, and as we do this, then we are also being instructed, taught the ways of God. And the ways of God are, you know, honesty, uh, compassion and caring for others, helping the hungry, helping the sick, helping those who are struggling in life, bringing hope to people. God's kingdom. And that God's love then reaches beyond national boundaries so that we can be bonded in love and so that nations can be strong and that nations can prosper together because Jesus Christ is our Savior, our risen Savior, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who saves us and brings us to eternal life. And so the kingdom, you know, as far as state and church, that they are to work hand in hand for the same purposes in the principles of God. You've been watching To Know Christ with Reverend Jeff Peterson, pastor at the Lutheran Church of Peace, Platteville, Wisconsin.